Okay, so mine is the most boring talk of the boring <laughs> session, just to kind of lay the groundwork. But this is very much kind of the basics of what perception is. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to, uh, to three principles, giving you a few kind of illusions and fun things as we go. So the basic principles here is that perception involves inferences and guesses about what's out there in the world. The perception is a form of active sensing and that it's also multisensory. Before I do that, let me just kind of clarify the term sense, sensing versus perceiving. So obviously the two are related, but we tend to think of sense, uh, sensing as being the translation of the physical world into kind of neural, in, in, neural signals. So we think of it more in terms of transduction, transforming one kind of physical information into something that the, the brain can work with. Whereas perception itself is more what you do with this kind of information in terms of uh, elaboration. So here, this is a good way of thinking about this. So at the bottom, we've got our sensory input. So we tend to think of five sensory organs. That isn't the, the truth either, but we can kind of unpick that maybe uh, at another time. But, but at least we have something along the lines of discrete sensors at this point. But obviously, as you convert that information into neural impulses, you're no longer talking about light and sound. All you're talking about is the activity of uh, things in the brain. So everything is talking the same language after you've done this. And at the top here, we've got everything else. We've got our memory, our culture, memories, experience, ideas, and so on. And the idea is that what perceiving is, is kind of the, the mixture of the sensory information based on your knowledge and your history. What you're trying to do in perceiving is make sense of the senses, in effect. You're making sense of the world around you, and you do this based on your knowledge of the world, your prior experience of it, uh, and so on. And there's lots of illusions that would illustrate that point, and I'll go through uh, some of them with you now. So here, this is... Um, a famous kind of colour or light illusion from Bo Lotto. And the key thing here is that the, the colour of that, uh, well, okay, let me rephrase this, that the physical colour of that and the physical colour of that are the same, by which I mean if you were to put a colorimeter on this and measure the wavelength of light coming off this, I could prove to you that they're physically the same. And in fact, if I peel away the... Um, the context, I can also demonstrate that they are the same. So what is going on here? Well, what's going on is that the brain is kind of getting something wrong in, in a naive sense of the word, uh, word. But actually, the brain is doing something sophisticated. So although we can justifiably say there's something wrong about this, the brain isn't doing anything wrong. It's trying to figure out what's out there. And that is right. That is what the brain's trying to do. And it's probably your intuitions about how the senses work that, that are wrong in this case. And what the brain is effectively doing is it's saying, hang on, I've seen objects like this before, and I know how colours change when they're in light and dark. And in effect, it's treating this as one surface of lightness and one surface of darkness. So it's not just looking at it pixel by pixel. It's taking in the context it's taking in its knowledge of how colours change in different contexts. And that isn't doing something wrong, it's doing something right. Uh, but it is different from what's happening on the eye, where you're, the receptors that respond to colour are to some extent getting it right. And your, your brain is um, making it even more right in terms of its uh, uh, knowledge and, and so on. So we have to rethink what's right and what's wrong. <clears throat> this is something called the hollow mass illusion. What most of you kind of have a sense of here, so is that going out or in? So now it's sticking out, and most people kind of have a sense of that. You can do this with a real mask as well. There's nothing uh, fancy going on. So now it's going this way, it's still going that way, and now. You have a sense of it coming out. So basically, the mask is, the face always appears to be coming out, even though you know that it's going in. So your beliefs here are telling you that it's hollow, but there's something about 
uh, this stimulus that, that's kind of, uh, you know, counteracting your, your beliefs about it and saying it's coming out. And basically what that thing is, is your, your structural knowledge of what faces are like, in, a, in, in effect. So you, you see your experience of 20, 30 years, however old you are, faces are of them coming out. And yes, you have some experiences of masks, and you understand what a mask is, but that understanding isn't quite enough to reverse your experience uh, of seeing faces as 3D and coming out rather than going in. So here, you're using your top-down knowledge of how faces are structured in order to figure out what the true state of the world is. And it's, in this case, it's giving rise to a sense of depth that isn't quite there. So here, you can probably figure out how this solution is created. But there's something very powerful about it that tells you even though you probably know that the room is not as it seems, that knowledge that the room is not as it seems is not enough to compensate for that person looking uh, really small. Okay, So most of you have a sense that, that there's something fishy about this room, but that higher order knowledge isn't enough. So basically what's going on here is that we live in a world in which we're used to seeing rooms that are square with right angles everywhere, and even though we kind of think that somehow there is a missing right, something isn't a right angle here, we, we can't reverse what we see. There would be interesting things to be done in other cultures. For instance, people who, indigenous tribes who live in forests who don't live in square rooms. And there is some evidence actually for these kind of cultural biases called the carpentered world hypothesis, that right angles do not exist in the natural world. They exist in the built world. Uh, and that maybe you can see this for how it is should you uh, live uh, in other places, Al although I'm not quite sure of the evidence of that. But basically the way that this room is constructed, and it's called the Ames room, is that it isn't right angles. So here, the, the person who looks like the giant is nearer towards you, and the person who looks like the dwarf is further away. And the room itself is um, raised here, the floor is raised. You probably have a sense of that. But they film it from such a perspective that you lose that, and you can put markings on the floor that make it look, uh, or give the impression of it being square when it is not. So again here, we're using our higher order knowledge of the world in order to construct information from the sensors. So the sensors provide clues as to what's out there, but it's really this interplay between memory, culture, memories, experiences of being in box-like rooms, experiences of faces coming out rather than going in, that is enabling you to interpret these senses. <clears throat> so my first principle here is that sensory information is limited and sparse, but we're able to construct a more detailed perceptual reality from the top down. And, and you, there are plenty of examples of this. So with colour vision, if you look straight ahead, um, you have kind of sparse information about colours in your periphery, but you don't have any sense of them uh, becoming less chromatic, for instance. What this means in terms of designing of technology, we, we can kind of uh, think about. I, I think what it means is that actually we can easily substitute one of these things and rely a lot on the, the stuff here. So maybe, for instance, we could have kind of artificial kind of inputs coming in and the rest of the brain will fill it in. Although we, uh, we could perhaps also imagine that we need our technology to be very rich and very detailed. But again, that might be a bit of a myth because there's lots of things we can do to make things appear detailed from information that's sparse or unreliable. But it might also pose natural uh, some challenges. So although you might be able to substitute one of these things for something technolo technologically based, doing something completely different like sensing infrared might be quite different because you haven't got the the kind of the, the knowledge or the experience for what that is or the context to, to slot that kind of information in. So the brain can compensate for noisy signals, but there might be some limits as to what you can do. So the second principle here is perception as active sensing. And perhaps the, the, the way or the intuitive way of thinking about this is infants learning about the visual world. So people who have had children, one of the things that's kind of 
quite exciting in the first few months of life is when they start taking an interest in objects and their hands in particular become objects of fascination in their own right. And here what they're trying to do is they're trying to learn about the senses by manipulating objects. So if you've got something like a ball or a sphere and you move it close to you, your retinal image would expand greatly. And that's kind of interesting because the object itself is not doing that. And you know that from feeling it in your hand, that it is constant and you can move it around. You can do this kind of hypothesis testing. So you're learning what it is to experience something visually, that things can disappear from view, even though you can still feel them in the hand and so on. You're learning uh, about that kind of thing. And this is one of the kind of classic studies done in the 1960s on newborn kittens in which you've got two kittens, one of which is said to be active uh, and walks around, and they, they kind of walk around in these kind of virtual environments here, and one that is passive, who basically is um, being carried to, to all intents and purposes by the active uh, cat here. And what you find is that although both animals are having the same visual sensory input or equivalent sensory inputs, they develop very different visual abilities. So the active cat, for instance, uh, passes a whole host of tasks that, uh, that the passive cat can't do. Um, so things like uh, the visual cliff is a depth-based illusion that it can recognize depth, uh, for instance, um, and also blinking when objects kind of come near it, these kinds of reflexive responses. And again, we can translate this maybe into the artificial world. So th this was research done in my university, but I, I don't actually know these researchers, but it's kind of based or adapting some of these principles from this kind of kitten experiment where they're building a robot. The robot's called uh, Koala. Uh, it looks like that, and its brain looks like that in terms of uh, this is obviously just a computer program that's uh, recreating... Uh, certain neurons. The interesting thing about this is that you've got uh, a set of, um, we can call them neurons, we can call them algorithms, all it is is just information basically that has visual inputs. But then you've got a set of things here that tell, give you information about how the robot is moving, where it is in space, and also its previous history of kind of moving and interacting with the world. And they do a whole host of simulations with this where they kind of ma manipulate the integrity of the, So proprioception is your feeling of where you are in space, a feeling of how your body is configured in space, the position of your limbs and your joints or your senses uh, and so on. What you find is that this, um, that this robot does a lot better when it's got all this kind of uh, knowing where it is in space in there uh, in terms of its performance. But actually the tuning of so-called visual neurons is much more well-defined in, in the presence of learning about how the, the system is moving through the space. So the, the visual neurons themselves that have uh, input primarily from uh, uh, a camera, but, but obviously can get input from other sensors via these weightings here, uh, they become more tuned and they, they function in a more precise way as a result of knowing about this. So here, this is about kind of moving through space, but of course the same happens for all of, well, not all of our sensory organs, but certainly those that we move. So one interesting thing is about the eye is that the, the image on our retina is um, constantly being updated as we move our gaze around. But we have a sense that our visual world is static and stable. And I won't go through this, but basically the idea is that the eye isn't all about kind of image processing. It's all about kind of looking at the muscles in the eye and understanding how the eye is moving and being able to understand how the visual world will change as a result of moving my eyes this way or that way. You can actually kind of predict what you might find, um, but you can also kind of create constancy in, uh, in the senses by knowing how things are moving. So that's the second principle, perception as active sensing. We learn to perceive by understanding how sensory signals change during self-generated movement. What does this mean for technology uh, development? Well, I've already given you one example with a little robot. I think what it means is that we have to think quite carefully about 
how the sensors are worn or manipulated by the user and not just on the kind of input that the, the sensor is receiving. So the kind of questions here is where are you going to put it? Are you going to put it on your head, on your fingertips, other places? And obviously there are pragmatic constraints here, but there are also constraints how you move it. So knowing how the signal changes um, depends on knowing how you're moving uh, the device in the same way as moving your eyes around helps you to know how the visual world is structured. You're going to need to know this for any kind of artificial sensor that you attach to the body. So there are certain design constraints here, but also there are certain learning constraints in the same way as an infant has to understand, you know, that an object really isn't changing in size by doing this. Whatever new sense you create, you're going to have to learn the rules of operation of that new sense, and you can't necessarily expect to know that a priori from first principles. How am I doing for time? <coughs> So the third principle is perception as multi-sensory. Really, all these principles are, are linked in the sense of what I'm trying to do is give you uh, a, the, the idea that the, the perceptions we create are based on multiple sources of information. So top-down knowledge, motor information, and information from other sensors, uh, in effect. That's basically the, uh, another way of kind of summarizing these three points. So again, there's all kinds of experiments and multi-sensory illusions that, that have been done, and I'll give you uh, some examples of this. Um, so eating and drinking are the, the kind of classic kind of examples of multi-sensory uh, processing, and people think here I'm talking about mixing taste and smell, and that's a very important part of it, but actually all of the sensors are involved. So a sense of texture in the, in the mouth, a sense of hardness, softness, creaminess, and so on. This is important. So there are experiments done where you can make a carrot feel very crisp or very stale, for instance, by manipulating the sound properties of food. So if you amplify the high frequency crunch of a carrot or Pringles, you make it taste a lot fresher, whereas if you dampen that down, you make it taste kind of stale and kind of bendy and so on. Um, the color of uh, food and drink matters a lot. So uh, people will give red wine uh, flavour descriptions to a white wine that has an odourless, tasteless colourant in it. And also, we, we kind of think that we don't lip-read unless you're kind of hard of hearing, but that isn't necessarily the case. We all can lip-read. At the moment, listening to me now, it probably makes no difference whether you look at my lips or not to, to, help, me, to help you to hear. But if you're in a noisy environment, looking at my lips will help you to hear. And the way it does it is very interesting because... Um, here, you're actually, the, the visual information will effectively amplify the signal in the auditory cortex. So you can show that the auditory cortex becomes kind of overactivated as a result of visual input in noisy situations. So it, re it really is the case that it can almost like be a crank on the volume by having uh, another sense stimulated. So this is one um, example of the fact that we're all capable of uh, using information from vision to, and audition to link it together. And this is called the McGurk illusion. It seems easy enough to separate the sounds we hear from the sights we see. But there is one illusion that reveals this isn't always the case. Ah, ah, ah. Have a look at this. What do you hear? Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. But look what happens when we change the picture. Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. Ba. And yet, the sound hasn't changed. In every clip, you are only ever hearing ba with a B. Because what you are seeing clashes 
with what you are hearing. So most people tend to give this, is, is that right? Not, not everyone does, and there are interesting kind of reasons as to why some people don't. Again, what's going on here is, is the same kind of principles we've been talking about. So uh, I'm not quite sure what was in this particular one. The standard McGurk uh, example has Gar going to the eye. So these are edited videos, and Bar going to here, and Dar. This sounds more like a Var to me, so I, I think that they're using some other visual stimulus in this clip here. Again, the interesting thing here is that your eyes and your ears are kind of getting it right, and your brain is to some extent getting it wrong, but it's getting it wrong in a sophisticated way based on its knowledge and history of how speech is generated. Basically, when you're looking at somebody speaking, we know how lips move and we know what sounds come out of it. So nobody in this room can do what that man did, okay? It was only done through some clever editing. So we have a history of knowing how sounds and uh, visual speech uh, work. And we use that history in order to make sense of the input, which in this case is contradictory. So the brain here is trying to resolve contradictions, and that makes it sophisticated. And it's doing a best guess, and that makes it sophisticated even though we can say that there is something that is objectively uh, wrong about the, the answer in this case. In a lot of cases, it's right, simply because people cannot do this in the real world. If you lived in a world in which people could do McGurk-like things, you probably wouldn't have these kind of associations developing. So it, 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 it does speak to kind of this knowledge and culture and so on. And... This is another kind of illusion called the rubber hand illusion. In this, the person can see a rubber hand here that's being stroked, and their own hand is being stroked, but they cannot see their own hand. So they are looking at this hand being stroked, and they are feeling that hand being stroked. So that's their visual perception of touch, and that's their felt perception of touch. And what happens is that you stroke both the rubber hand and the real hand at the same time like this. <laughs> and, and here this person obviously responds as if his own hand has kind of been being stabbed. And you can measure this in terms of skin conductance response and so on. Uh, there's a whole cottage industry that kind of shows when you get the solution and when you don't. So it's not the case that having a hand in front of you is enough to kind of elicit this reaction. So if you, if you just have a dummy hand in front of you, you won't get that. If you stroke out of sync um, with uh, the, the real hand, the dummy hand, you don't get it uh, either. So th there's a whole set of conditions that determine when you get that kind of illusion. Uh, and I'll come back to this a bit. So, there are rules about when the senses combine. And again, this is partly learnt as a result of knowing uh, how the world is structured. Um, so we tend to merge information from the senses when, when sound and vision are, say, coming from the same spatial location. We're more likely to treat them as, respond, as referring to the same thing than when they come from disparate sources. Also, when they co-occur in time, this is important. So again, the rubber hand illusion is abolished when things aren't happening in uh, time with each other. We're more likely to do it when the information is kind of ambiguous or imprecise. Um, so again, here with um, things like audio-visual speech, if you can hear somebody speaking really well, then the information from the vision is less important. Um, it also depends on how ambiguous the, the kind of the, the vision and the sound are as well. So in the McGurk illusion, if you reverse the bar and the gar the other way around, you don't get the illusion. That's because some of the lip movements, you can predict um, exactly what it is, and some lip movements are not so predictable. So again, here, it depends on the precise stimulus, not just even on the uh, audio-visual kind of domain uh, globally. And also, that we, we kind of pair things together if there's a prior association. So in speech, there are prior associations between how speech sounds like and what it looks like. There are also a whole other set of rules which might either be learnt or might kind of reflect deeper structural properties of the brain. And these are called correspondences. So this is an example about 
which of these shapes is called Buba and which is called Kiki, or you can come up with other sounds. A lot of people say that's Buba and that's Kiki. There are a whole other kind of uh, domain of experiments with it. So if I ask you which one is more sour, people go with this. If, I, if you ask composers to compose salty, uh, I don't know, salty music, it tends to be more staccato than legato. There are all these kinds of uh, interesting ways of linking the senses. In some extent, um, infants kind of know these as well, which has, has led to the idea that they might be innate. But of course, an infant would still have a few months uh, of experience. But either way, there are meaningful associations between the senses, some of which are obviously learnt, as in the case of speech, and some of which might be learnt. Uh, it's kind of more of an open question. But either way, we can perhaps use these principles in order to guide technology design. We might think about how we can express one sense through another, or we might think about if we're trying to learn a new kind of sensory system. How does that sensory system relate to all the other senses that we've got? And can we use those other senses in order to help us to learn about what, uh, what, what's going on with the new technology? So those are my three basic principles, and I look forward to questions later. Thank you.